Okay, so we're now we're back for part two of our quadratic forms lecture. Now we've said how important it is to know about the sign of a quadratic form, and in particular to know if it's always positive or it's always negative. Uh, I should add, by the way, that there's one more reason why, important reason for economics, why we want to know whether the, a quadratic form is always positive or always negative, and that is that uh, that will give us conditions that uh, help to characterize situations, decisions that an economic actor takes that are either maximizing some objective function or minimizing some objective function. So, for example, uh, if we want to know that a consumer is maximizing utility, we will want to know, it turns out, whether a quadratic form associated with his or her utility function is positive definite or negative definite. If we want to know whether a firm is maximizing profit at a particular decision of inputs and outputs, we'll want to know whether the quadratic form associated in some way with its profit function, and we'll say associated how, uh, we want to know whether the quadratic form is always positive or always negative. And so here we have the kind of crucial definition that we use to be able to talk about and work with the notion of uh, quadratic forms that are always positive or always negative. So we say that a, po that a quadratic form uh, is positive definite if it is pos its value is positive for every vector in Rn, of course, except the zero vector. We say it's negative definite if, it is n if its value is negative everywhere in Rn except the zero vector. We say that it is positive semi-definite or negative semi-definite if it's always greater than or equal to zero in the positive semi-definite case, always less than or equal to zero in the negative semi-definite case. Again, in each case, for all vectors in Rn except the zero vector where, for sure, the quadratic form is always exactly zero. And notice, too, that we not only say the quadratic form is positive definite, negative definite, and so on, but we also say that the matrix that defines the quadratic form is similarly positive definite if its quadratic form is always positive. It's negative definite if its quadratic form is always negative and the same for semi-definiteness. So though that definition, these terms, are going to be important and being able to now figure out what characteristics of the defining symmetric matrix make the matrix positive definite and therefore its quadratic form always positive, same for negative and so on. Figuring out what characteristics of the defining matrix give us positive definiteness, negative definiteness and so on, that's going to be really important for us and that is what we're going to do, I won't say next, we're, it's almost next because I want to do one more thing first before we go there, and that is I want to come back to this question that we raised a little bit earlier about whether we can say that a quadratic form is strictly a strictly concave function like this uh, if its quadratic form is always negative. In other words, if it's negative definite. Can we say that a quadratic form is a strictly convex function? So we've got something looking more like a bowl, like one of the one of the pictures we had over here. Can we say that it's strictly convex function if the matrix that defines it is a positive definite matrix? if the quadratic form is everywhere positive. It seems intuitive that must be the case, uh, but that requires us to prove something. So let's actually prove that. Then we'll go on to figure out the characteristics of the matrix that will actually give us a positive definite or strictly convex 
quadratic form function, or a negative definite, uh, strictly concave quadratic form. Now we've said that, we've conjectured that a quadratic form is uh, strictly convex, a strictly convex function, if it is positive definite. And we've similarly conjectured that the quadratic form will be a strictly concave function if, it's, if it is a negative definite quadratic form. And so that conjecture turns out to be correct. Actually, it's if and only if. So let's write that down as a theorem and see if we can prove it. So we have here our theorem. A quadratic form q of x equals x a x is and we're going to do this just for the strictly concave, the positive definite case. It's obvious we can, by just taking the negatives, we can, we can convert that to strictly concave and uh, negative definite. It is positive definite if and only if it is strictly convex. So let's see if we can prove it. So let's uh, say for any, okay, we want to prove that it's a strictly convex function. So we have to take two points in the domain, an arbitrary two points in the domain, distinct points, because we're going to show it's strictly convex. So we have to take two distinct points in the domain and show that when we take the line segment between those two points and we take the values at those two points and in the line segment, we're going to show it's strictly convex. So we have to show that the line segment between those two points lies strictly, strictly above the graph. So we have to make that analytical. We have to make that geometric insight analytical. So we take two points x and y in R n, they have to be distinct points. It's okay if one of them is the, the origin, the zero vector. Uh, and to give myself a little more room, well, I think I can probably squeeze this in here. For every lambda in R, well, let's uh, actually uh, remember that what we have to do is we have to uh, look at q, the function evaluated at what I've been calling x of lambda. So remember that I was using x of lambda as this sort of shorthand here. So uh, I was writing x of lambda for 1 minus lambda times x plus lambda times y. And so I need to put that vector x of lambda on both sides of our matrix A here, and then carry out the matrix multiplication. Turns out that's kind of a mess. It's a, the, the, the matrix algebra is kind of messy if you do it. You can try it. it. Maybe it'll work better for you, but for me, I found it kind of messy. So remember that we could also write this as x plus lambda times y minus x. So that's just another way of writing the same convex combination. And that turns out to be a lot more straightforward in terms of the, the kind of matrix algebra, at least for me. So this then is uh, x plus lambda y minus x times a. And then on the side, we have the same thing, x plus lambda y minus x. Now I'm going to move way over here with that equal sign because I'm probably going to need more space over here. So if I carry out the matrix multiplication, you can do this arithmetic yourself. Uh, 
sometimes we say, don't try this at home, but this is something you maybe you should try at home. So this is going to be x, a, x. That part looks obvious. This is going to be 2 uh, lambda uh, x a y minus x plus lambda squared y minus x a y minus x. Okay, so I've skipped a couple steps there. You can fill those steps in. Hopefully <laughs> I did it right and you get the same thing I get here. Um, so let's see what we have here. Let's, first of all, let's notice several things. One is that lambda is between 0 and 1. Uh, and in fact, I said for every lambda in R, this is wrong. <laughs> this is wrong. This should be uh, for every lambda between 0 and 1. Okay? So we're looking at convex combinations. That was a mistake. Okay? Uh, so we have, as I said, uh, lambda is between 0 and 1. It's strictly positive. It's not 0. Uh, when lambda is 0, we're just right at x, and so that we already know what happens at x. So lambda is strictly positive, and so that's smaller than lambda because lambda is less than 1. That's positive. That's positive but smaller than lambda. And uh, y and x are distinct, so this is not 0. This is a non-zero vector. And over here, I've got a non-zero vector. I have a positive definite matrix. In fact, let me back up a little bit here. I'm proving this is positive definite if and only if it's a strictly convex quadratic form. What I'm doing first is assuming that A is positive definite and showing that Q is strictly convex. I may leave the converse for you to do because that's actually really easy. Um, but let's carry on here. So I'm going to assume that A is positive definite. So this vector is not the zero vector because y and x are distinct. So I've got a quadratic form here in which I have a positive definite matrix and a non-zero vector. So this whole term here, this quadratic form, is itself a positive number evaluated at this vector here. Here, uh, I don't know whether I've got positive or negative because uh, while well, that's positive definite, the, I don't have the same thing on both sides, so I can't say. Over here, of course, uh, we've got positive definite, so this is going to be positive. So I don't know what's going to happen here. So let's note then that, in particular, this is positive. This is positive and less than lambda. So that means that this thing here is smaller than this without the squared. So in other words, if I, let's actually take that equal sign off of there, this is less than x a x plus 2 lambda x, sorry, 2 lambda x a y minus x plus lambda y minus x a y minus x. That, and again I'll leave you to do the, the uh, matrix uh, arithmetic, the matrix algebra, to get here, but this is equal to um, x a x minus lambda 
xax plus lambda yay. Again, I'll leave you to do the matrix arithmetic to take this down to here. And that is, I've got xax minus lambda xas, so this is 1 minus lambda xax plus lambda yay. Well, that actually is going to complete the proof because this is q of x and this is q of y. So I've got, this is equal to 1 minus lambda q of x plus lambda q of y. And so I have established that at any point on the line segment joining x and y in the domain, the value of the function, the quadratic form, at that, in fact, let's even draw a little picture here. Let's suppose this is y and this is x. So we're down in, we're in the domain, and I guess the domain is r2, the way I've drawn it. And so maybe this is x of lambda. So we have established that at any point on the line segment, the value of the quadratic form in the third dimension here is going to be smaller than the associated convex combination of the values. In other words, we've established that the graph of the quadratic form, which is where this value lies, is below the uh, convex combination of the values on the graph at x and y. This is exactly that the function q is a strictly convex function because this is a strict inequality for any distinct x and y and any lambda in this interval here. And so that says we are done. We've completed the proof. It wasn't hard. Uh, it involved a little matrix algebra that I actually left out, but that's, it, that's stuff you can do. And so we have got a proof here that if we have a positive definite quadratic form, then it is a strictly convex function. And this is really the same. It's a corollary by taking the negative of Q and the negative of A that uh, if the quadratic form is negative definite, then it's strictly concave. But this is if and only if, so we have to go the other way. We have to show that if the quadratic form is strictly convex, then it has to be positive definite. And let me ask you uh, to take just a moment and think about how you would start a proof, how you would kind of go about proving that if I have a strictly convex function, uh, a strictly convex quadratic form, that it will be positive definite. So just think about that for a moment. Maybe pause the, maybe pause the, uh, the video for a few moments and think about how you would sort of start out trying to prove that. Okay? Okay, so if you did pause it, I assume that you uh, did some real, real thinking here. And now, uh, you're back, and so let me suggest how to go about doing this. Well, we want to show that if it's strictly convex, uh, if it's strictly convex, then it's going to be positive definite. So one way we might want to do that is to get the contrapositive to actually show that if it's not positive definite, then it can't be strictly convex. That's what I would first try here, and so. Because all I have to do is say, well, if it's not positive definite, then that means that I have some vector where x a x is less than or equal to zero, right? If that happens for any x, 
it's not the zero vector, of course. If that happens for any x like this, then this is not positive definite. So what I would do if I were you, uh, and you might want to do this because I might make this an exercise, is to, uh, to say, suppose that this quadratic form is not positive definite, so we have a vector like this, and show that it couldn't possibly be strictly convex. And so that will establish the if and only if theorem that says quadratic form is positive definite if it's it strictly convex. And of course, we get the, uh, we get as a simple corollary, it's negative definite if and only if it's strictly concave. And you could do the same thing here with a weak inequality to show that if the quadratic form is positive semi-definite, so that this is not necessarily positive, it might be zero away from the or, uh, origin, that it will be weakly convex. Again, I'll say that again in words here, that quadratic form is positive semi-definite even only if it is convex. It is negative semi-definite if and only if it is concave, not necessarily strictly so. Okay, so that's a, a short uh, additional uh, result that uh, turns out to be useful. Uh, it turns out to be useful when we're actually trying to do things, but it maybe is even more useful just conceptually in terms of thinking about and picturing uh, having the intuition, the geometric intuition about quadratic forms. So that's it for uh, this part of our quadratic forms lecture. And so we're going to come back next time and we're going to figure out what uh, characteristics of the matrix A correspond to having a positive definite quadratic form, a strictly convex quadratic form. So we will do that next time. And that's it for now. See you next time.